Hallelujah. And Lord, we do thank you for the privilege of coming into your throne room through our prayers and supplication. Thank you, Lord, that we are able to join in that chorus that in heaven when the angels are singing, holy, 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 in the earth your people are echoing, holy is the Lamb of God. As we worship you today, let sinners be convicted and converted. Let sick bodies be healed. Let the glory of our God be revealed. Satan, you have no place here. The Lord rebuke you. God turn you away. For the people of God will have victory. And knowing you like we do, we thank you in advance for everything that you are going to do in this place today. Hallelujah. 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 Yea, God, we praise your name. Praise your name. Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. Now, Lord, the, the remainder of this service is totally released into your hands that you will accomplish whatsoever the Spirit has designed and we'll say yes and we'll say yes and we'll say hey, thank you. Glory to God. Be seated if you can. Mm. Hallelujah. Praise your name. God bless you. Please be seated. Truly.
Hallelujah. The steadfast love of the Lord never changes. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. New steadfast love of the Lord never changes his mercies never come to an end they are new every morning new this much of it. They are new every morning, new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O serve a faithful God. Hallelujah. Take your seats if you can. Now, I was able to bring the word this morning at 745 without uh, getting emotional. I'm, I'm fighting it now. But um, you don't, you don't know what it is like to go through the valley and the shadow of death and be brought out on victory side. If you, if you, if you never, if you've never been there, you don't know what it's like. But somebody in here other than me can say, been there and done that. Now you're all going you're all going to have to help me preach. And the, the only way you're going to be able to help me preach y'all got to stop messing with me now. <laughs> yeah. Come on, please take your seats if you can. Oh, bless 
his name. One. One. I want, I want to, if possible, for these next few minutes, the Lord has given us a theme for this year, and we have proclaimed this year 2006 as the year, not of prayer, but the year of answered prayer. And I do believe with everything that is within me that many of the prayers that we have been praying and seemingly found no answer to that we are going to experience many answers to prayer during this year of 2006. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you from the subject of how to have your prayers answered. And because I had not spoken in quite a while at the 745 worship and here at Temple of Deliverance, uh, 745 and 11 are actually two different congregations. Uh, you may end up seeing a handful of people at 11 who came at 745, but for the most part, uh, we are one church, but we are two congregations. And I shared that same message with them this morning. But as we continue in the trend of God answering prayer, we want to talk today about a prayer for healing. I'm finding that there are more people, saints, members even of Temple of Deliverance, Church of God in Christ. There are so many people who are sick with various diseases, illnesses, and infirmities. But I believe that the Lord Last Sunday was the 22nd. I thought about it many times prior to last Sunday, but it never crossed my mind. Last Sunday was January 22nd. I didn't think about it till Elder Norris Gray called the house after service to tell me happy anniversary because it was January 22nd, 1957. 49 years ago that I preached my first sermon. Uh, so I have completed 49 years in the ministry and now entering my 50th year. And in all of that time, in all of that time, I have prayed for sick people, 
I have seen miracles right before my eyes, deaf ears unstopped, blinded eyes open, lame people and strokes delivered. Uh, a lot of that seemingly happened under the tent. Of course, now God himself has to order me to go under the tent. I, I just don't <laughs> deal with tents anymore. But um, out of all of the experiences that I've had in praying for other folk, I never expected that I would personally have to go through the kinds of things that I have gone through within the last uh, uh, two years or so, maybe two and a quarter years. And to my surprise, God has used my own illness and healings as a means of strengthening the faith of not only the saints in this place, but uh, all across America and around the world, not only in the Church of God in Christ, but in various other organizations. I had the privilege of speaking with a young man who happens to be in our orchestra, and uh, he said to me just a couple of days ago that, Bishop, watching you and how you have reacted to the things that you have suffered have helped to strengthen my faith. And it's one thing to tell other folk that it doesn't matter what you're going through. If you can have it, God can heal it. And if you preach that and teach that when it happens to you, then you've got to be an example of what you preach. One of the surgeons that was not the main one that operated on me December 30th, but one of the doctors in his office uh, said to me that it would be about six months before I'd really be able to function normally. And um, 18 days later, I was in Detroit, Michigan, funeralizing Bishop Bogan. And I have found that if you preach the power of prayer, if you teach what faith in God can do, then you yourself must be a living and walking example of that faith that you teach. I said earlier that there are many people who have various illnesses, diseases, infirmities, and I'll just use right now the words of a song that we used to sing that said, it is no secret to what God can do. I wish you'd turn to somebody and tell them what he's done for others. He can do the same thing for you. <laughs> oh, yes. Let's go to the general epistle of James. Now you got to go all the way back toward the back of your Bible now. If you want to go from Revelation backwards, you can <laughs> find it easier that way. Come back through Jude and 3 John and 2 John and uh, 1 John, Peter, and then you'll get to James. And this particular passage of Scripture we have used many times. And I hope you have your Bibles because right now I'm more in a teach-preach vein. I want you to read it for yourself. 
and know what the Lord is saying. I've already given you my subject. It's a prayer for healing. So God bless you, ushers. We're going to start James chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 13. Listen at the question that uh, James asks. And here's a beautiful thing about the Bible. Although I'm talking about a prayer for healing, we're going to come across some verses and some phrases that's going to deal with God's ability to rectify more than just physical healing. The first statement that we have here in James 5.13, it asks, is any among you afflicted? Now, most of the times when we use the word afflicted, we think that afflicted means the same thing as being sick. But look up the word afflict. And the word afflict means to cast down, to strike, to humble, to distress severely so as to cause continued suffering, to trouble, to injure. A lot of you are not sick and haven't been sick, but you certainly are afflicted. Some of you on your job, they're putting you down. In this day of, uh, you know, rap music, hip hop, these rappers have words to their so-called music that deals with killing law enforcement officers, demeaning women, and some of you all are living in a marriage where you're constantly being afflicted, being put down. I'm not talking about you, whoever it is thinks somebody been telling me something. I'm just telling you what I know is going on in general. Some of you are in situations where you're so distressed, suffering continually, you are afflicted. And the answer to it is not getting somebody's prayer cloth or by law. It's not going to see that person who is supposed to be so gifted so they can give you a word. He says, if any afflicted among you, do what? Let him pray. Maybe you need to tell your your neighbor sitting next to you, God allows some things to happen to make you pray. (laughs) Yeah. You you know, this this is the day when they tell you all you got to do is get up in the morning and make a positive confession. Honey, let me tell you, there are times you're going to have to do more than just make a positive confession. You're going to have to turn your knees into prayer bones, and you're going to have to pray. One day, I'm going to speak again about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Paul had something that kept him praying. He said, I went to the Lord about this thing three times, and the Lord finally told him, I'm not going to correct it. But you got to understand, my grace is sufficient. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. And then when those good times come, and you are happy, and you're merry, said, let him sing psalms. Then we come to verse 14. Is any sick 
among you? And, and that answer has to be yes. There are people who are physically sick, others who are emotionally, mentally sick. Some are sick in their spirit. And some are just sick and tired. <laughs> But he gives you a different answer here. Is any sick among you, do what? Let him call for the elders of the church. Now, now understand this. The word elders in Scripture originated from those who were heads among certain tribes in Israel. This was talking about those who were senior in age. And those persons who were senior in age had the responsibility of passing down to the younger their experiences and their knowledge of Israel's God. But then there is also in the New Testament the reference to those who claim a call within the gospel ministry who are ordained as elders. But I believe that this passage is really referring to either category. Either that person who is a senior who is old enough to know what God can do, or that person who has been formally ordained into the ministry. Uh, I think that it's good. You can use an ordained elder, uh, but if it's not an ordained elder, I think you can get uh, a senior brother or a senior mother and, and call for them. Call for whoever is available and let them pray over that sick individual. Now, now this is very important. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, there, there are a lot of things that uh, I must confess that in my younger days as a preacher, I spent a lot of time doing that I don't do as much of now. I, I had more energy then. My focus was a little bit different. And practically every Tuesday night when we were still at Holy Temple on Wilson Street, Tuesday night was night of deliverance and hardly a Tuesday night passed when I did not anoint the saints with oil and many times give out those little bottles of oil. And people who came to those services or that joined our church, they had to be prepared for the critics on their job because the people love to tell, oh, you go down there where that man grease you all up <laughs> with all of that oil. And when you think about it, anoint means to rub, pour, or smear on. Doesn't have anything to do with drinking or taking internally. It has to do with applying to the exterior. Now, what can oil being rubbed on your head do when you're suffering with some terrible internal disease? The truth of the matter is there is no power in the oil. But the next verse is what tells you. It says, anoint with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer. See, whenever you got that and, you know, you're connecting something. When you get to but, that means you're going another way. But it says when you anoint with oil and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Well, what is the prayer of faith? The prayer of faith is the prayer of obedience. Yes, There's no power in the oil, but you are healed as a result of being anointed with oil because first of all, the person doing the anointing is obeying God and the person who submits to being anointed is also obeying God. And the Lord knows that to the world, the unconverted world that is foolish. So you got to remember that it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching. The things that we are motivated by and the way God moves in the midst of his saints is something that the world can't understand. 
That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you can't see this. You can't understand it. And the things of God are not to be understood. But when you obey, when you exercise faith. See, if you really deal with James, and, and, and it took me a while to understand James. Because Paul was the one always talking about, you know, faith. Uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. Then you turn to James, and James said, well, you said that you got faith and have no works, but I'll show you my faith by my works. He's not really talking about works of individual righteousness, but what he's really talking about when he says, I'll show you my faith by my works, he's talking about acting on what you believe because he comes right out of that and talks about Abraham and he believed God and because he believed God he offered his son now God didn't take him but he offered him hello somebody you can say all day what you believe but your belief isn't faith until you act you can be sitting there right now with sickness in your body. And the Spirit of God at a certain point may tell you to just get up and go around this church praising God. You hear it in your spirit, but you sit that they'll think something wrong with me. You believed, but you didn't turn your belief in the faith because you didn't do. Y'all didn't know what I'm saying. So, belief becomes faith when you act. Hello, somebody. And usually the things that God charges us to do are things that will look foolish to the world. But we're going to have to learn to stop trying to please an unbelieving world and learn how to please God. Said the prayer of faith, which is really the prayer of obedience, shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up and this is one of those things that the devil will really do to you. The devil will tell you, I know all that's in the Bible, but God's not going to heal you because you know what you did last week. <laughs> He's not going to deliver you because you did something. That, 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 that's, that's some sin that you've committed. But James said, let me take that away. Yeah, you got some sin you need to repent of, but... He says the fact that you've committed sin isn't going to stop God from doing what he wants to do. He says the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Are y'all looking at verse 15? And the Lord shall raise him up. I, be, I, bet, I better stop there for a minute. You all that go to the hospital, quit trying to pull folk out of the bed. It's not your job to raise them up. It's only your job to pray and anoint them with oil and let God do the raising up. <laughs> Some of y'all get through visiting the sick and the doctors and the nurses. Don't nobody want you back in that hospital. <laughs> the prayer of faith shall save the sick. Uh-oh, I got a few of them looks. I'm sorry, just got to tell you like it is. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven. I'm glad that I serve a God who forgives. He, he, he's not like man. So many people now, you look at them and, and you know, Something happened 15 years ago. And you still sitting there with your eyes crossed. And the other person is shouting and praising God and going on that merry way. And you're up here holding a grudge that's so severe until when you comb your head, the hair comes out in the comb. Get in the bed trying to go to sleep. Feel like something crawling all over you. I mean, nerves bad because of stuff you're holding. The Word of God tells you that when you pray, if you have aught against any, 
meaning if you got anything against anybody, forgive. Because if you don't forgive them, Jesus is talking now. He said, if you don't forgive them, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. As long as you're holding anything against anybody, God's got something against you. If they've committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. Then it says, confess your faults one to another. Now, don't take that too far. That's not saying tell somebody your most innermost secrets. Well, I thought that for sure she'd keep it. If you couldn't keep it and it's yours, you know they're not going to keep it. That confess your faults really mean, you know, confess that that is an area where you need some prayerful support. In other words, you know, pray for me. I've got a, a serious health problem. Uh, uh, pray for me. Uh, you know, I'm in need of a, of a real financial miracle. Uh, you know, pray for me. I've got some problems in my family. That, that's a weak area. Don't go too far. Don't tell anybody too much. Now, this may not make you shout, but it'll help you to live if you listen to it. Confess your faults one to another and what? Pray one for another. In other words, don't, don't, don't try to make everybody believe I got it made and everything is all right and you know, I'm on victory side. I don't have a pain in my body. I don't, don't have no financial need. I don't, everything is fine. No, admit. The song that we have on, on our new uh, CD on, uh, you know, uh, singing the old time way. The second one that's, you know, just in the process of being released. Uh, that second song on there said, pray for me while time is going well with you. Pray for me that the Lord will carry me through. In other words, if time is going well with you and time may be rough with me, the time will come when things will be going well with me and they'll be rough for you. So it simply means that we both confess that there is a weakness and that there is a need for God. So that was another old song we used to sing. Uh, you pray for me and I pray for you. I know the Lord will answer prayer. So he says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another. Why? That ye may be healed. No need to lie there on the bed. Talking about, well, you know, God know I'm here. And if he want to heal me, he'll raise me up. I had people praying for me for so long, but my mind was focused in another direction. And God didn't start to move in my life until I decided that I wasn't ready to leave here. And then I joined in the folk. They were already praying for me, but I wasn't praying for myself. My wife got angry with me because I wouldn't pray for myself. I wouldn't pray for myself because I was ready to leave it. And one day I decided I'll make too many folk happy if I leave here. <laughs> so, so I'm going to join with those who are trying to help me stay here. Yeah. You got to get to that point. Hallelujah. Fess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. And then he comes to something else. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Now, now let's look at this word effectual. 
The word effectual means producing or able to produce a desired effect. In other words, when you're praying, you're not just generalizing, but there is a certain area. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. Where you want God to do something in that particular area. Well, let's listen to what Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty three. Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. In other words, you don't want to pray and say, Lord, you know, I got a job and it's way out east, uh, it's way down south, and I don't have no transportation, so uh, I'm praying for you to make a way for me to get to my job. That ain't what you mean. Your way may be somebody else that lives, you know, near you and work in that same area. And you got to wait on them. And one time they'll get you there 30 minutes early, next time 30 minutes late. What you really want to tell God is, Lord, I want you to give me a dependable car. Yeah, that, that's what you really want. You got to learn how to pray specific prayers. If you're going to pray an effectual prayer, there is a certain effect that you want to take place. So you got to be specific with God. You got to quit generalizing. Any way you bless me, Lord, I'll be satisfied. You don't mean that. There's a certain way you want God to bless you. You don't want God to just bless you with a car. Cause a car may be a smoke mobile. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man and that means woman as well avail it much uh, well then let me look at this effectual producing or able to produce a desired effect but then you got the word fervent you got two words here one is effectual the other one is fervent what does it mean for a prayer to be fervent Fervent comes from a word that literally means to boil, glow, or burn. <laughs> Fervent means very hot, marked by great warmth of feeling. Oh, I, I know we live in a day now when there ain't supposed to be no feeling involved in your religion. So what you basically hear now, you hear those little quiet prayers. And Father, do so and so and so, and we'll praise your name. There ain't nothing fervent about that. A fervent prayer. Sometimes you find yourself crying before God. When David prayed fervently, he said, I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. Well, you see, I'm not emotional. All I got to do is follow you to the basketball game. You emotional about everything except seeking the face of God. And God is not going to let you use and burn all your energy in stuff of this world and then come before him with that little quiet, well, I, I want to ask your heavenly father if you would just... Do so and so and so, and I'll praise you now and forever. Amen. You better learn how to pray fervently. You better learn how to let that thing boil, let it glow, let it burn, let it become a very hot prayer. God, I need you. Hallelujah. I'm not ashamed to tell you how much I need you. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. Fervent and effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then he uses an example, and I'm going to soon be finished. He tells me about Elijah, who here in verse 17 is called Elias. He was a man 
subject to like passions as we are. My God, you go back in the first Kings, you'll think that Elijah was some kind of a mystic. You think he is somebody that, that, that God dropped out of heaven because you don't know nothing about him. He appears on the scene of time without even having a birth certificate. Nobody knew who his father was. Nobody knew who his mother was. But at a time when Ahab and Jezebel had taken Israel into such depths of idolatry, God had to bring in a special man for a special time reached over behind the mountain and he brings out one by the name of Elijah. Nobody knew who he was, but he walked in before Ahab and said, as I live, said God, there shall not be dew nor rain falling on the ground, but according to my word, takes an invisible key and locks up to heaven, goes down to the brook Kirith, drinking water out of the brook and being fed by a raven two times a day. Didn't anybody know who he was? Finally, at the end of the famine, he goes up on the mount and calls down fire from heaven. And then when he gets ready to leave, he steps on a heaven-bound chariot and goes up in a blaze of glory. Oh, somebody said, yeah, he just walked in to Ahab and said, it's not going to rain, do not going to fall, but according to my words. And he just spoke the word. But see, you got to read James. James said he was a man subject to like passion as we are. He was a man with the same emotions as you and me. But he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. He walked in and told Ahab it's not going to happen. But when he got through talking to Ahab, he went out, put his head between his knees, and said, God, I spoke the word. Now, Lord, bring it to pass. It's all right to get up and make your positive confession, but when you get through confessing, you better go somewhere and pray. Hallelujah, because the God that I serve, he didn't say he was going to answer your confession without prayer, but he did tell you that if you pray, good God from on high, whatever you need, whatever you ask of him in prayer, believe in, and you shall receive. Well, I'm going to have to close. He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Prayed again and the heaven gave rain. And the earth brought forth her fruit. Mm. But as I close, I just want to tell you that God does answer prayer. And when you pray even for healing, that healing becomes a reality. If you don't believe it, you can read this when you get home. The 38th chapter of the book of Isaiah introduces me to a king by the name of Hezekiah. One day Isaiah the prophet went by to give him a word from the Lord. And I want you to know God said, Set your house in order. I'm not talking about sweeping the living room, but I mean write your will. Determine who you want to succeed you as king. Do all of those things that a man will do when he knows he's getting ready to die. You got to die and you can't live. And then Isaiah walked out. But when he walked out, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall. Lord, you know how I've walked up rightly before you with a perfect heart. And I just want you to know that I'm not ready to leave here yet. And while he was praying, the prayer went up the wall and it went into the atmosphere and it kept on through the stratosphere and through the troposphere and the ionosphere. It, it went on in the interplanetary space and it went into the throne room of heaven and knocked on the throne of God. And God spoke to Isaiah, said, go back. Tell him I've heard his prayer. Go back. Tell him I've given him 15 more years. I want him to know that all he's got to do 
is put a lump of figs on the boils and in three days <coughs> he can go up to the house of the Lord yeah I serve a God that it doesn't matter what you have if you have it I heard him say he can heal it I know man does anybody in here know him today I know a man I know a man that can heal both soul and body I know a man that can heal all manner of disease. Do you know him? What's his name? Jesus. He is the healer. He is the miracle man. Give it to him. I don't care what the doctor said. Give it to him. He'll heal you. He'll deliver you. He'll set you free. He'll raise you up. Hey, 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 hey. Glory. Hallelujah. 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 You ought to tell somebody, whatever disease is in your body, agreeing with you that this is your day of healing turn to somebody else tell them I command you to be healed be delivered and be set free oh oh